Guten Tag, meine Damen und Herren. Ich I would like to greet you all to this open forum. Welcome to you all. The basic idea of the open forum is Okay. So, the basic idea is well, there are only two languages. You can only choose between the original and the translation. It's either German or English. I hope English is coming through. Can you hear English? Good. So, to start again, the open forum has the basic idea of also bringing to in bringing people who participate at the World Economic Forum behind all these barbed wires and in all these protected environments with the public to discuss interesting subjects. Now, if we look at the subject of this panel, which is what next after the elections in November, I think we can be very pleased with the excellent quality of the panelists that we've been able to convene here, and I would like to thank you so much for accepting to come and participate in this panel. So what next? We have five panelists who will be answering this question. You have here Robert Portman, who has an awful lot of experience from Washington. He was an Ohio member of Congress. He has helped organize lots of electoral campaigns with and for the Bush family. He was also the trade representative of the United States, so he knows an awful lot about trade and trading negotiations. He was also director of the Office of Budget, or the Budget Office, so head of the Budget and Finance Department. So I'm sure he will be able to tell us a lot about financial and economic policy. In fact, he is of Swiss origin. This is, I'm sure, something that he has had to hear lots of times. His family comes from Herbertsville in Solothurn, his uh, ancestors, and they had a right of citizenship in Ashlismat in Lucerne. Howard Dean III, is also an ideal negotiating partner here to tell us what will come next after the elections. A year ago, Howard Dean was an outsider in the electoral campaign last time around and uh, moved to the top in a position of a favorite and then had to go through all the ups and downs of such a presidential campaign. He'll tell us something about it. Originally, he's a doctor by training. He, is, he was governor and deputy governor of Vermont, and he is now head of the Democratic Party, and therefore very closely involved in the electoral campaign. So welcome to the panel. Then we have Robert Edgar. He's also, he's also been a member of Congress. He's from Pennsylvania, born in Philadelphia, if I'm not wrong. He is a parson by training. That's his career. He had a career as a parson, if you can say this. For a long time, he was the president of the National Council of Churches. His main focus was the fight against poverty, and he dealt with this subject a long time before anyone understood how important this was. Now he is in the lobby common cause, at the head of it, in fact, to make politicians a little more accountable, change the way the elections are managed so that people are more in the forefront than money. Then Mr. Gelsemann, Olaf Gelsemann, he is a German journalist. He is the deputy business editor of Welt am Sonntag. He was working for Financial Times, the German edition. He was in Washington, D.C. for six years. So he knows his way around um, financial and economic policies in the United States. And he's written a, pro a, a book. 
And the title, which is very long, is something like The False Fair of the Germans Vis-a-Vis -vis of the Americans' Cowboy Capitalism. Then we have also Ayatollah Dr. Mahdi Haddavi from Iran. He's one of the 300 Ayatollahs, and I'm very grateful and thankful that he has been willing to join in in this panel. If I understood it correctly, an Ayatollah is a person, one of the few persons in Iran who can teach philosophy and law from the Quran. He works at the center. of Shiite Islam. He is portrayed and described as, and he may smile when I say this, but if I read what he, what he said here, he is described as someone who is very conservative regarding certain social questions and much more liberal regarding other questions. So I'm sure in the discussion we'll find out on which points he's conservative and where he's liberal. Where he may probably be someone rather special, as in the case of Mr. Dean. He is a person who uses the Internet very much. Mr. Dean is the other one. In 2004, Mr. Dean was able to raise a lot of money via the Internet, much more than the other candidates. And Ayatollah Hadavi is, I think, the only Ayatollah who actually works with internet and teaches via the internet. So you can actually contact him via the internet and philosophize with him, chat with him on the internet. So I'm very pleased with this panel and its composition. So let me now turn to the subject. What next? What do you think is going to happen after the elections in November, the elections in the United States? We are still in the run-up to the elections. There's still a few months until then, but I'm sure we can already guesstimate a little bit. Mr. Gelserman, first of all, do we in Europe have to worry about who's going to win these elections or not? Or is it going to be the same whether it's a Democrat or a Republican who's going to win? Does it concern us? Answer, yes, of course it, it concerns us. I think... The main question is whether Mr. Giuliani will win or not, and let me explain this. There are still a few candidates in the running who will most likely not be the present John Edwards for the Democrats and for the Republicans, Mike Huckabee. So if we really look at those who have a true chance of winning, then both on the Republican and the Democrat side, you have people who would bring about a change in policies internally and externally, with the one big exception, with the exception of Rudy Giuliani, the former mayor of New York. I think with regard to policy vis-a-vis -vis of Iran and economic policies, special fiscal policies, he will probably be the only or is the only heir or successor of Bush. Robert, Robert Edgar, you are a Democrat. Do you agree with this response? Do you believe there will be a change, except if uh, Giuliani is elected? Well, I think Giuliani is not going to be elected, and, uh, you know, I joke and say, if your children don't like you, it's hard to become president. <laughs> uh, my sense is that this is a year of change, but it follows on the change that took place in 2006. In 2004, we were still locked into the neocon strategy that had been in place for the first four years of the Bush administration. In 2006, I think middle America, middle church, middle synagogue, middle mosque, all of the, the faithful middle pulled the center of the country back to the middle. And I think in this campaign, both in the Democratic campaign and the Republican campaign, words like change and new vision move us away from prison camps on uh, Guantanamo, uh, first strike policies, 
moves away from kind of a narrow view of the world. And uh, I think the most exciting and hopeful thing for this coming year is that whoever gets elected will in fact return us to the what our founding fathers and mothers were hoping our nation would be. 9-11 forced us into a setting where politicians started to use fear to organize ourselves. And my hope is that we move away from that fearful strategy and recognize that the United States must be a humble superpower, not one with arrogance or greed, but one that works to build a larger uh, partnership with other persons around the world and work on some of the basic issues that all of us face, like global warming and uh, some of the issues of addressing the needs of the poor. Ayatollah Hadavi, any frage? A question for you, a question I've always wanted to put to an Ayatollah. When you're in Qom, when you teach and observe uh, world politics from there, Does it interest you at all to see who will be winning the elections in the United States? In the name of God. Uh, you know, we should analyze the issue from two different aspects. One is that if you're talking about the mainstream in the United States, I think that there will be no difference uh, if Republicans win or the Democrats because they are still talking about uh, superpower. And maybe, my dear uh, co 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 partner here, he says, uh, humble superpower, but they are still thinking about superpower. They are still thinking about global leadership. They are still thinking that their issues are out of United States. They do not have any problem inside United States and they think that they are responsible for the others and they are not responsible for their nations and therefore the mainstream will be the same. Of course there is some differences between Democrats and uh, the Republicans because the Republicans they will cut, in, my, in Persian we say, they will cut the head with sword while the um, Democrats they will cut it with cotton. They will do this in the same sense but in different styles of course Uh, and if you refer to the words of, and papers of the, these candidates, you will find them that they are all talking about uh, the same issues but in different literature. And I think if you refer to the basic, basic ideas which have been produced, uh, unfortunately, during these last decades in the United States, we will find it very, very harmful for the United States because it is uh, breaking down all the bridges for the United States to uh, continue his path and to be as he, they are supposing to be as a superpower. Because I interrupt you very, very briefly. Now, if the American president is not called Bush or Clinton or all these white politicians, if it were to be a black man and Barack, be called Barack Obama, from your point of view, since you're touching upon cultural differences, does this open up a new dimension or is it the same old story? It is not the story of black or white. It is not even the story of Islam or Christianity. It is the story of mentality which have been produced during these recent decades in the United States after the Cold War, and they have thought that they are the, last, the, the uh, unique supreme power throughout the world, they are the unique superpower throughout the world. And I think this idea will make the United States in a crucial situation, and it is now in the crucial situation, and what has happened during these last Uh, six years or eight years, I think was the most harmful situation for the United States. And I think the United States is the last uh, empire uh, in the globe. It's the last global entire and, uh, empire, and it will be the end of the empire era, as I said. Howard Dean, reden wir rasch über. Let's uh, talk about the campaign and to what extent Iraq plays a role in this campaign. 
it has been a defining subject, I think, of the campaign, the electoral com campaign. You are, is this still the case? And you should know this since you're very central of the Democrats' electoral campaign. Well, I, yes. Um, I do want to respond both to uh, my Iranian friend and my uh, Swiss friend briefly about the differences in Europe and Iran. And I think they're both, uh, I think uh, my Iranian friend is correct, although for the wrong reasons. And I think uh, my Swiss friend is not correct. I think there's going to be an enormous difference whether you have a Democratic or a Republican president for Europe. Every person who has a chance to win the, Democrat, the Republican nomination is for continuing the war in Iraq. That's a huge difference in a, uh, between Europe and the United States. Every single Democrat is for getting the troops out of Iraq within the next 13 months. That's a big difference. I think you'll see a much more respectful approach uh, from a Democratic president uh, than you will a Republican, uh, Republican president. I think for the last eight years we've had a real problem uh, the way we've treated our friends, let alone the way we've treated our enemies, and I think you'll see that disappear. With respect to Iran, I would agree with the Ayatollah. I don't think you'll see a big difference in policy. You'll see less rhetoric about dropping bombs, but there are deep fundamental values differences between the Americans and the Iranians. Uh, we believe that human rights is very important, particularly women's rights. Uh, we believe uh, that funding terrorism is, is something that's very dangerous and we will continue to oppose that no matter who uh, wins. Uh, and we uh, believe that the nuclear weapons question must be resolved uh, in the interest of safety, uh, of the, sa the safety of the world. Um, with respect to, um, basically you're asking me who I think is going to win. No, uh, <laughs> I'll come to that. Uh, I'll ask a very, ich werde darauf kommen. Yes, I'll come back to that and I will uh, of course, want a very clear answer to that. But is Iraq less important now? The role of Iraq in the elections, right. Um, Absolutely, yeah. The role of Iraq in the elections is still important because 65% of independent voters in the United States deeply oppose the role of the war in Iraq. Every Republican supports the president, uh, and none of the Democrats believe that we should be in Iraq. So we have a built-in advantage uh, with, uh, with any, against any of the Republican candidates. But the number one issue will be the economy. Uh, that also is going to work in our favor because the fact of the matter is I, I'm not aware of any election in which there was a major economic problem that the party uh, who caused it was reelected. Um, and so I think that the economy is going to continue to be in trouble. I think the stimulus package is great. I don't think uh, you can stop uh, recessions with stimulus packages. Uh, given the fact that this president has run up the largest deficit in the history of the United States of America. Uh, that is a hole that I don't think we can get out of uh, in the next few months, and I think that's one of the reasons there's very likely to be a change in party in the White House. Uh, Portman. Mr. Portman, a question for you. Is this observation, this statement correct? That Iraq is receding into the background regarding the subjects in the campaign, is it the economy that's more important, and, and who is this going to whom is it going to help? I would agree with uh, my friend Howard Dean on that. Uh, <laughs> it's interesting because what, what's happened in the States is as the economic situation has become uh, a higher concern, it has replaced Iraq as the top issue in Ohio, my state, for instance, which is a state which will be crucial again in the presidential election, uh, in many polls now, Iraq is number three after health care and the economy. So I think uh, Howard's correct. Uh, there's a poll out uh, a couple of weeks ago showing that 46% of Americans now think the war in Iraq is either going well, very well, or moderately well. But that's almost double from where it was in March of 2007. Still not half. So it's still not a positive political issue. But the two things that have happened is, one, as the war has gotten better, there have been fewer casualties, less violence, it's not on the front pages at least as much. It's not a, a, a concern of as many Americans. Um, and second is uh, the economy, frankly, and, and health care, at least in Ohio, has become more crucial. So I, I, I would agree with that, and it's partly uh, but because... But it's of not going to help the Republicans a lot, is it? Well, I, I think what will help the Republicans is more the kind of data I just mentioned a second ago, which is not so much whether it's the most important issue or not, but how people feel about the war and how's it going. Uh, General Petraeus uh, 
laid out this new strategy, which was met with a lot of skepticism. Now people um, in the middle, those who are more independent and certainly on the Republican side, at least, are uh, more supportive. And that's because of the results. Uh, on the Democrat side, uh, it's still, and Howard can speak to this much better than I can, but it's still very negatively viewed. But yeah, it's, it's not going to be as difficult an issue. No, what, for, my for question was, it would have been. the fact that the economy plays a major part now compared to two months ago, is yeah, that going to help the Republicans too. a lot, is it? Well, it's, uh, it's interesting. Back when Bill Clinton was um, president and taking credit for a good economy, I think he felt he didn't get enough credit. Uh, back when President Bush uh, inherited uh, a tougher economy and a recession that really began in 2000 for recession 2001, I think some were surprised he didn't get blamed as much. Uh, what's happened in American politics over the last 20 years is that the president does not get the blame that he or maybe she in the future used to get. Uh, there's a poll out in the last couple of weeks showing uh, that President Bush gets the highest amount of blame, 19%. This is a poll taken uh, by Bloomberg uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it says mortgage lenders get 15%. And it, back when, again, the 2001 recession hit, the number one reason people thought we were having a problem was the business cycle. So in a sense, President Bush and the Republicans may sidestep a little of the blame that even a couple of decades ago would have been firmly with whoever's in office. Uh, despite whether their policies caused it or not. Now it's a little more complicated, in part because everyone in this room, uh, just as most Americans, uh, are watching uh, CNN or CNBC, and people are more sophisticated about the complexity of the global economy, not just our economy. We're all affected by the global economy now. And uh, so it, it will be a political issue, but I don't think it will be uh, as key an issue as some others. And, and one is just uh, the perception of the candidates. And you talked about that earlier with regard to uh, Senator Obama. Uh, Olaf talked about it with regard to uh, Mayor Giuliani and other candidates. Uh, some of this will come down to personality. Some of it will come down to uh, issues that really don't relate directly to Iraq or the economy more than it might have in, in other elections. Uh, the, the electorate is not happy uh, in the United States. The, the mood is not good. There's a story in the New York Times today about that. Um, but I'm not sure that these two issues are going to be the key determinants. In terms of Europe, just quickly, I say I do think there will be a difference. I agree with Howard on whether there's a Republican or a Democrat elected. The issue I focus on more, of course, having been trade representative, is the issue of protectionism or economic isolationism. And I worry that that's growing in the United States and that our Democrat I'll nominees are, I'll get you that. Uh, are, are I'll get you that issue. On that. Thank you. I'll get you that issue. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Mr. Gelserman, do you see it the same way if economic affairs take such a front seat, looking at what is happening on the stock market, the subprime problem, what is the political fallout going to be of this? Well, if there is a major recession in the United States, then that would be uh, of benefit to the opposition. That's natural. But I'd like to come back to one point, and that is something that was raised by Robert Portman just now, and this concerns economic policies. I think this is where we'll have the major change, the largest change. We can expect a big change here, because the next president will probably be more protectionist than the current one. Whatever you say about George Bush, Jr., even if he has been an opportunist in political terms, was clearly an advocate of free trade, and he also had a very liberal view regarding immigration policy. So regardless of who the next president is going to be and with, from which party is going to be, or she, uh, the next president will certainly be more protectionist regarding immigration from Latin America, from Mexico, if it's a democratic uh, president, it will be a more protectionist trade policy that will affect us in Europe. In the last eight years, under Bush's administration, we did not have this kind of protectionism. Perhaps we could uh, stay on this subject of economic policies. 
Perhaps our dean could respond to that. That's the cliche. If the Democrats come to power, then the protectionist customs duties will increase. And you want to protect your constituencies. I strongly disagree with that, particularly as, as it uh, maintains to Europe. I think the Democrats have become much more knowledgeable and thoughtful about the role of trade. Uh, the role of trade is very important for geopolitical stability. Uh, and I don't think you'll see a massive reversal, and I don't think it'll have any effect on Europe whatsoever. The biggest problem with trade in the United States is trade from developing nations, uh, which sometimes use uh, other methods besides tariffs to keep uh, our products out, uh, and sometimes uh, have labor and environmental standards which are very different, which are in effect a subsidy. Uh, that does not exist with Europe. If anything, Europe has higher labor and environmental standards than the United States does. So I would envision no protectionism of any kind with Europe. I'm sure there'll be some trade disagreements, as there always are, between major, uh, major economic blocks. I think there will be perhaps an effect on our trade with some of the developing countries. I think we will, you will, under a democratic administration, see a continuation of the idea of free trade, but we will insist on incorporation, as we did with uh, the Peru Free Trade Agreement, which was just approved by a democratic Congress, the, the incorporation and the enforcement of trade and, uh, excuse me, of labor and environmental standards to reduce the, uh, the hidden subsidy that those, uh, the lack of enforcement uh, causes. But it will be difficult, and I'm turning to Mr. Portman, to prevent the relocation of massively, massive jobs on, to the third world without um, Americans and everyone stepping on the toes of these developing countries. Well, I would have two, two responses. One is uh, there is a difference in terms of the announced trade policies of the candidates. And, and on the Democrat side, at least what uh, Mrs. Clinton and Mr. Obama and Mr. Edwards certainly are saying is a departure from where President Clinton was uh, during his eight years, where he promoted uh, more open markets in particular, encouraged not just free trade agreements, such as uh, the Peruvian agreement that, that Howard rightly cites, but also the multilateral system. And to see Mrs. Clinton uh, in her interview with the Financial Times a couple months ago, some of you saw this, get into a back and forth with uh, Peter Mandelson, the European Commissioner for Trade, I think uh, probably says it all. In other words, Europe is affected by that. If uh, she is elected, she says that she will not uh, be continuing along the same path that her husband took or that George Bush has taken. Olaf is right. The president, uh, current president has been very much uh, committed philosophically to the notion of more open trade because he believes it is the best thing for the economy and we can give a shot to the global economy, particularly developing countries. And she has said, no, we need to review where we are in the Doha negotiations, which is the multilateral trade negotiations that happens once a generation. It's been going on for six years. The hope is to finish it up this year, but likely it will spill over into the next administration. In fact, almost certainly it will for a vote in the Congress. So this is a big issue for not just Europe. It's a big issue for Iran. It's a big issue for the entire world because the global trading system uh, really can't just stay where it is. It, it, it's like a bicycle rider. You know, you, you stay where you are and you fall over. It needs to move forward. And so that, that does concern me, and it should concern all of us, uh, particularly Europeans who are, are more dependent on trade than we are. Um, with regard to job loss, uh, I, I agree this is a huge issue politically, and it's a tough issue. And what Howard was saying is accurate in the sense that the focus has been a lot on China in particular and uh, markets that are now emerging developing countries, and yet the analysis is pretty clear, which is that most of that job loss, the vast majority of it, is from technology, productivity, efficiencies, just as it is in the economies of every single country of every person in this room, even if you're from China. You're seeing fewer manufacturing jobs producing the same amount of output, and that's a tough thing to explain politically, and we saw this, uh, Howard, in that Michigan primary where I think Mitt Romney effectively used that issue um, in getting the upper hand on John McCain uh, in, in the last couple of weeks there. So that's a tough issue, but the data points to the fact that it really is not a trade issue. It's a, it's a productivity, and, effective, and effectively it's become a big political issue um, that will have an impact after the election on the, on the trade issue. If a Democrat's elected, there's more likely to be more uh, of this protectionism, more economic isolationism. 
Ayatollah Hadabi. Well, Ayatollah, Mrs. Rice, during the opening of the forum, spoke uh, about uh, commercial and trade policy. She spoke about free trade with Iran, insofar as Iran met the requirements in relation to uh, nuclear activities and uh, abandons the idea of uh, nuclear arms. Is that not, in the present economic circumstances in Iran, an interesting possibility? Uh, before that, I'd like to answer to some points that have been raised here. One is that the main differences, the main difference between Iran and the United States is the issue of human rights. I do not agree with this idea. If you refer to this research, uh, who, who speaks for Islam, which has been done in the United States by Gallup organization, uh, an American organization, you will find that uh, the Iranians are so much similar to American, and the similarity and commonality between Iran and United States, I mean the nations, are so much amazing. And the issue of human rights, if it is the main problem for the United States, how the United States had good relationship with Saudi Arabia while they do not have any kind of human rights there. How they do have so much relationship with Kuwait where there is no uh, human rights there. Uh, they are, I think the problem of human rights should be studied in the United States. I was in 2004 in Barcelona, a symposium of human rights. There was a huge number of uh, American professors, activists in the field of human rights, and they were talking about the uh, situation of human rights in the United States, and it's miserable. And I think the human disaster is now happening in Guantanamo, Abu Ghraib. I was last Friday in Red Cross headquarters in Geneva. I had a session with high rank officials there, and they were talking about the issue of Guantanamo. They were saying that there is no assistance from the United States side with us about the issue of Guantanamo. This is a, a disaster that in this century, 21st century, we have a medieval uh, prison and we are still talking about human rights. Uh, I think these words have been repeatedly said by Mr. Bush he says that the people, they are the enemies of the freedom, the enemies of democracy. But if you refer to this Gallup research, you will find that the majority of the people, even the Islamic radicals, even them, they are also looking for democracy. They are also looking for human rights. It shows that the problem is somewhere else, as I said, human rights. It's the situation is not good in the United States, it is not good in Guantanamo, it is not good in Abu Ghraib. And I think if we want to solve the problems, we should not neglect the facts. If we want just to repeat the same uh, words that was repeatedly said, okay, we will be, we will be in the same situation. I think there are Swiss diplomats who represent the United States in Iran and uh, Iran the USA, and there are certain Swiss diplomats who have tried to explain that certain values are, we are closer to each other than we believe, but I think that uh, there's no point now, I think there's no point now if we accuse the Americans if you don't uh, fulfill human rights and then you say that uh, the Americans aren't meeting their human rights responsibilities because the theme is what next? Ted, if you refer, I would like, I suggest it, if there is a group of expertise in human rights, they come and they value, evaluate this human rights situation in Iran and in the United States, and gave a neutral report about the situation. And then you can say if the human rights in Iran is worse than the human rights in the United States. I would like you to do this because some of the Americans have done it before and they say 
that the human rights situation in the United States is worse than the human rights situation in Iran. I, I'm not saying so. The, a Jewish professor in the United States said it uh, in 2004. About the issue that uh, Ms. Condoleezza Rice raised in the opening ceremony, I would like to emphasize on this point that uh, United States, I think, has reached to this point that they could not neglect the role of Iran in Middle East, and not only in Middle East, but also throughout the world. And therefore, there is no other option for the next president to ha change the situation with Iran. If they want to continue the way that they have done, they will see that there is no, not so much uh, positive advantages for the United States. They have reached even to the same conclusion inside Iraq, that if they want to solve the issues inside Iraq, they need an Iranian side, and therefore even if it, Iran was not invited in the first and second seminars about Iraq, and now Iran is talking about the issue with the United States, and there was bilateral uh, dialogues about the issue. Okay, so I, I understand you properly. This is an interesting statement that you make. If you want to solve the situation in Iraq, you have to involve Iran. We heard that before. And the other thing you said is that it's connected to the Middle East issue. Uh, Bob Edgar, is there any chance? Is there any hope, any possibility that whether we have a Democrat or Republican after George Bush, that there will be a very different foreign policy than that of George Bush. Absolutely. Um, I think Guantanamo will be shut down. I think we'll stop the secret prisons and the preemptive uh, strike policy. I think um, in a new administration, they'll figure out that uh, we've got to move in new directions. And I would say to my friend from Iran that uh, I think the United States, when I use the term humble superpower, I imply that there's a lot of work we need to do inside our own country. Uh, nine million of our children have no health care. Forty-seven million Americans have no health care. There is one unique thing that is different in this election than before, and that is the role of the Christian religious right, the uh, uh, hardcore radical Christian right has diminished in power have lost um, ground, and many conservative evangelical Christians have read the Bible literally enough to discover that God cares about poor people and God cares about care of the earth and stewardship. We had one evangelical leader who actually said in the question of uh, life issues that global warming is a life issue. And I think in this election you're going to see a faithful majority of moderate evangelicals, moderate to progressive uh, religious leaders, Christians, Jews, Muslims, stand up and speak out on the issue of addressing peace and nonviolence, addressing the issue of poverty, and addressing the issue of the environment. Would that include that the next American government would exercise pressure on Israel so that certain positions be abandoned? so that there would be a bit of freedom, so to speak, so that there could possibly be a solution to the Palestinian problem, or would we still be dealing with the same old problems there? I don't think you're going to see as dramatic a change as some of us would like to see with a, a more equal policy between Israel and the Palestinian question, but I think uh, you will see strong support for this two-state solution, and I think the next president of the United States will not wait seven years to visit the Middle East. I think the next administration will recognize that we need to uh, be partners in the dialogue for peace. And also, I think we've got to recognize that part of our problem in the United States is our whole history over the last 25 years has been based on trying to get oil and cheap oil and not going to renewable energy sources. And I think there are candidates in both political parties now who are recognizing that that has been a blind spot for the United States and that we must seek alternative energy sources, renewable energy, reduce the uh, need for oil, and continue our work in the Middle East 
to find peaceful solutions. And I think it has to involve Iran, has to involve Syria, has to involve the other neighbors in that region. And I hope that also the faith communities, Christians, Jews, and Muslims, can sit down as brothers and sisters of faith and have some track two diplomacy along with our governments uh, to seek ways of living together in this uh, small village we call planet Earth. Howard Dean, that's clinked it's all. Howard Dean, that all sounds very optimistic. Do you see the things in the same light? That's to say that uh, the issue of the Near East will become more important, that there will be a possibility where we can take up what the Ayatollah said, that's to say that we will be included in the discussion? I think that you'll see a renewed um, emphasis on the Middle East between the Israelis and the Palestinians if the Democrats win, because we've, uh, we've done that. I think Bill Clinton and Jimmy Carter were the people who came closest to uh, moving the parties together. The fundamental problem um, between the Israelis and the Palestinians is that right now both governments are weak, uh, and the radicals on both sides make it impossible to get settlements. When Abbas wants to move, Hamas throws some rockets at Sidorot. Uh, when uh, when uh, the Prime Minister of Israel wants to move, uh, Bibi comes out and starts talking about a more, a more vigorous approach uh, and then threatens the, the coalition of Olmert on the right. So what, one of the things we have to have is strong leadership among the Israelis and the Palestinians and do that. And when we've had that leadership, we've been able to get closer. Um, so um, I do think that the solution to the Israeli-Palestinian uh, problem that's gone on for 60 some odd years uh, is something that's gonna be put back on the very top of the agenda uh, by a democratic president. Uh, but the solution is very, very difficult. And, and again, in deference, uh, deference to civility, um, it is not made easier by people who fund violence in the Middle East. Mr. Portman. Mr. Portman, I would like to come back to what Bob Edgar said a little earlier. I apologize to what Bob Edgar said a little earlier. That's to say the question of the pressure of the very conservative right to wing religious groups in the United States which have lost ground a little bit and that means that there's more political leeway. You've been involved in election campaigns, you know the mechanisms on the right. Do you think that the very conservative evangelical groups, evangelical conservatives, do you think that they actually have become weaker and lost ground and that therefore now there is more leeway for the right in general? Uh, Casper, I don't know because uh, we're still in a primary mode. So it's true that um, uh, Governor Huckabee, former governor of Arkansas, has energized some support uh, among evangelical Christians that uh, perhaps wasn't expected during this cycle. So you've seen a little bit of a change already. But where you really will see whether there's interest and whether there's what we call turnout, which is the key thing in American politics, you know, only half of Americans vote even at a presidential election, so the question is who comes to the polls. Um, that will happen in the general election, and, and again, Howard Dean is more the expert on this than I am, but if you look at the polling data on the candidates who might win, Mrs. Clinton tends to be uh, a relatively polarizing figure. She's well-liked by part of the electorate and not well-liked at all by another part of the electorate, and it's um, some would say George Bush also has some of those attributes now where people have strong views and uh, that might generate quite a bit of support among some evangelical voters who might not normally uh, focus on politics because they'll see that she would have the opportunity to appoint Supreme Court justices, that some of the policies they care the most about would be affected very directly by her presidency with a Democrat Congress. So we'll see. I mean, I think it's premature, um, as Bob said, to say that um, there's there's been a big shift in, in power or in voting voting there. Bob also said something else interesting, which is that evangelical Christians don't all vote alike, which is true. And there are different issues that, that uh, come to the fore, the environmental issue he talked about. Um, so we have to be careful not to pigeonhole people on on the right or the left. You know, in, in Europe, it's usually about five to uh, 50 parties 
dividing up how everybody feels about everything. And uh, even within your coalitions, you have a lot of different points of view. It's hard to say what's conservative, what's what we'd call liberal, you would call uh, maybe more tolerant or socially liberal. I, and I think that's true with the evangelical Christian vote also. Um, can I just pick up on, on one other thing quickly, and that's with regard to uh, the Mideast and what the difference in an administration might mean. I think to your question, uh, Casper, about pressure, there's pressure being applied now on both sides. And uh, Secretary Rice talked about it in her speech uh, at the World Economic Forum, but uh, we should all pray that in the next few months even, that we see significant progress. There's a timeline now to try to push toward the end of the year, but in the first few months to try to make some initial decisions on a two-state solution. And uh, there's pressure being being applied, and we'll see. I mean, sometimes these things do happen toward the end of administration um, in, in the Mideast, and then the next president would be able to come in not with a fresh slate because these problems have been going on, as Howard Dean said, for 60 years, really for 2,000 years, and but it at least would allow that president maybe not to be um, as focused or even obsessed with that issue and be able to deal with some of the broader issues in the Middle East, including uh, getting Iraq on its feet and uh, uh, dealing with some of the issues we've talked about uh, with the Ayatollah today. Javits Baf. Well, I have uh, respected uh, what was uh, supposed to be discussed and uh, my journalistic views, my personal ones, uh, have not been put forward. And now I feel that in conclusion, before I give you an opportunity of raising questions, I would like to say something about the long-term problems as to who is going to win. I asked Dean who we thought would win amongst his uh, people, because, of course, you know uh, those people best, uh, but I think that you would probably avoid giving a, a response. So I would like to ask uh, Robert Portman, which Democrat is likely to be strongest? Uh, everyone uh, who I know in the political game would have said uh, before the Iowa vote uh, only a few weeks ago that Mrs. Clinton was going to be the nominee on the Democrat side. No one had any questions. They may have said they did, but they really didn't. Uh, the Clinton machine is pretty effective. Uh, now, uh, obviously, there's a bit of a question, and some would say toss up 50-50 because uh, Senator Obama did so much better than expected in Iowa and kind of has this momentum slowed in New Hampshire. Uh, Howard Dean, among all of us, knows best <laughs> what can happen to momentum. Yes. Uh, <laughs> he was there. In fact, I was at the Iowa caucuses the night uh, he won. I was there representing the Republican side. The Republicans also caucused that night. Nobody paid any attention because our nominee was a foregone conclusion. But um, things can change quickly in American politics very quickly. So now I would say Mrs. Clinton, although she took a big blow in Iowa, my own view is she is uh, going still to be difficult to beat, and she's still the odds-on favorite. So you're on the record. Don't ask me about Republicans, though. You got to ask right. me about Republicans. You're on the record, 50-50 for Clinton. No, I, I think she's just over 50-50 now. All right. Yeah. Howard Dean, uh, we are discussing this. I'm not discussing that issue, but just the question: which Republican is going to make the running? Prediction for the whole uh, campaign. I thought Mitt Romney was going to win because he's very well organized. He's an attractive uh, candidate, and so forth and so on. Uh, I think I underestimated the ability of John McCain to come back, and now I think uh, either one of them could win, uh, the most likely. I think uh, Rudy Giuliani will lose in Florida, and that will be the end of his campaign. I wouldn't entirely discount uh, Governor Huckabee. Governor Huckabee will have a very strong following in the su uh, southern states, and I think he could uh, win some of them. So, but I believe uh, that it's a toss-up between McCain and Romney, and I can't make, I really don't have the ability to make a prediction beyond that. 50-50 McCain? No, I, I think it could go. Romney is very well organized, uh, very, very well organized, and he's got lots and lots of money, including his own personal money, and that makes a difference, too. So, so you're on the record 50-50 Romney. No, I'm on, the, I'm on the record as anybody can win this one, and we'll take them both very seriously. One thing is uh, there are a lot of people in Europe who think the Democrats will win with no problem. It's not true. 
the Republicans may not be able to run the country very well, but they're very good at winning elections, and they haven't lost their ability there. <laughs> so they're going to put up, this is going to be a very tough campaign. If the Democrats win, it will not be by a big margin. Eine kurze Frage noch an Bob. A brief question to Bob Edgar and one for the Ayatollah. For you, Bob Edgar, once again, we've had uh, the American primaries and now we're talking about change. People believe in change. There's a woman there. There's a black uh, candidate. It's all change, change, change. And at the end, we have John McCain. He's been uh, in Washington for 700 years. And Hillary Clinton, and, and she's been there as long, more or less. Not much has been said so far about uh, how uh, Barack Obama has uh, energized all of the candidates on both the Democratic and Republican side to talk about change and renewal and new ideas and kind of new hope for our society. And it was interesting to me after the Iowa campaign that both political parties picked up on that issue of change. Many of the commentators are asking the question, what does it mean in terms of change? What What does new direction mean? What do new ideas mean? I think if Barack Obama were elected, I think there'd be a whole generation of new persons selected for cabinet positions and positions inside of government uh, that would bring fresh ideas. Uh, I think with uh, McCain and Hillary, uh, you have the uh, opportunity uh, to see people elected who are fairly predictable in terms of how they will move forward. Uh, the, the amount of change to me uh, will be less, uh, but regardless of whether it's McCain, Hillary, uh, Obama, or any of the other candidates, I, I don't think anyone can get elected president of the United States in this cycle who doesn't have a new vision for America, both domestically and internationally and have uh, captured the imagination of people. I think many Americans have said there's a plague in both the Republican and the Democratic Party, and they want to see the nation uh, move forward uh, with a new vision of what it means to be an American in this society and at this time. And, and that's a difficult thing uh, for all of us because uh, it's hard to put uh, details on what that change means. But uh, I'm hopeful. I'm an optimist. I think faithful people, Democrats, uh, Republicans, Christians, Jews, Muslims, and others are, are all hungry to see our nation recover some of its international respect and also recover some of its uh, moral authority internally in the United States. Herr Gersemann. Mr. Gersemann. And the Ayatollah haven't had that much opportunity to express their views since we're talking about the American elections. So here they are the superpower. They no, 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 no. The uh, <laughs> main share of for, for everything am, they should be the boss. With all with all due respect, I am not American controlled. No, no, yet. no, no. I don't uh -huh. say so. I say the Americans are president here. They are the great boss here. Okay. Um, dann wollen wir doch mal ins Publikum gehen. Well, let's turn to the audience now, the public. Who would like to put the first question? Please raise your hand, ask for the microphone. The um, presidency issue in the United States, I think... Just very that, briefly, okay? Uh, okay. I think the chance for the um, Democrats is more than the Republicans because uh, the Republicans have lost their situation during these two um, periods of Mr. Bush. And even if they pay a lot of money, I don't think they will be easily uh, successful in this election. And if they will be successful, I think it will be much more harmful, it is my own opinion, if they continue their policy, uh, internal and external policy, and I think it will be the last, some last years of the superpower of the United States. About the issue of Middle East, I'd like to pay attention, all of us, to pay attention about the issue of Gaza, which has become a great prison now. And unfortunately, previous uh, Friday when I was in Red Cross headquarters, uh, it was uh, at that day that uh, Gaza was closed and there was no way to enter or come out of Gaza even for the Red Cross officials. 
and uh, it needs a global and it needs an international help to help the people, Palestinians in the um, Middle East. And I'd like to mention this point. We had a workspace yesterday about the issue of Middle East security and economics in Middle East. It was in a fantasy world, and we reached to some explicit uh, conclusions during a few hours while it has not been reached during half, and half a century, because if we want to be rational and to be wise and to use our wisdom, the solution is easy. The solution is regional cooperation without any foreign interference in the Middle East issues. This is the main solution and the key factor that will be able to solve all the political, uh, economical, social issues uh, issues inside the Middle East, I'd like to mention this once more, that I'm this small village, the globe, does not need any superpower. We are wise enough, we are mature enough to talk to each other and to solve our issues without any need of a grand dad or grand power. Let the record show that the Ayatollah has endorsed the Republican candidate for Oh, I, I heard just the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, I say that the hard situation. Thank you very much. That is a plea in favor of a rational discourse. That is what I take from what you have said. I think we've got this common denominator, this plea in favor of a rational debate and discourse. Please also give your name when you get the microphone and just put a short question or make a very short statement. Don't uh, start speechifying. Hello, panelists. I'm a journalist, so I keep my questions short. There is okay? A, no statement. You stand up and wave your hand. I can't. Ah, okay, he's over there. Over there. Ah, thank you. Okay. Uh, my first question would be... Um, uh, yeah, okay, so it's a, s a small statement, but nobody here <laughs> has mentioned the word nuclear. And if we talk about the United States and we talk about Iran, the word is nuclear. So number one, what should be the Iranian policy towards the United States? Number two, what should be the policy of the United States towards Iran? And number three, uh, which is a bit worrying in a way, um, perhaps... Uh, what should be, uh, in, in your view, uh, your, your opinion of the fact that less than 50% of voters go to vote for a president in the United States? Uh, so, um, I, yeah, let I, me just take care that we don't lead a discussion on the sole issue of Iran. The, the question was, what next after Bush? But we can once again this address this question to the Ayatollah, what would be an American policy that would lead out of this uh, very, very fundamental problem that we have, namely the fear of many a nation in the Middle East of a possible nuclear uh, Iran. Wie geht man an dieses Problem heran? So how, what, what do you expect? What do you expect? Next president, so things can move forward. Brief uh, answer. Okay. Uh, I'd just like to mention this point, that the nuclear efforts in Iran are peaceful, and I emphasize that this process will continue. Who is the president is not important. Therefore, we ex I, am, I am just saying my own personal view. Of course, it is not the official view. I am not uh, a member of the gov government or something like this. But my expectation from the next president is to accept the human rights inside and outside the United States, in Iran, in Israel, in Palestine, and to accept that to use uh, nuclear power peacefully is a right for all the human beings, they can have it, and to use it in the wrong way as a weapon, it is not permitted, not to Israel, not to United States, and not to others. If you, it is done, if the discrimination was omitted, I think many things will be solved. Bob Edgar, the American Seite. 
What about the American point of view? Can one develop something from this? Let me just speak uh, as strongly as I can. I think the United States needs to cut in half its nuclear weapons immediately to set a more uh, modeled standard in the world and continue to reduce nuclear weapons. I urge all nations to recognize that there is no military use for nuclear weapons. Henry Kissinger has said that, a fairly hawkish uh, Secretary of State. Uh, Sam Nunn, a former senator, has said that. We need to uh, internationally reduce the number of nuclear weapons, and the United States would have more moral authority if it began to dismantle its own nuclear weapons, and if administrations, both Democratic and Republican, would stop asking the House and Senate to build bunker buster weapons and to renew our nuclear weapons going forward. I'd like to address your issue of uh, Americans voting. It is uh, an embarrassment to me as president of Common Cause, an organization formed to increase uh, people's ability to vote that less than 50% of our people vote. I think we've got to find some systems, make sure that our votes count, that there is a paper trail on our elections so that people feel when they vote, uh, their vote is cast. I also, and this may not be supported by either Howard or our other colleagues here, I think we ought to have a national popular vote for president. Uh, right now we have 50 states voting and an antique electoral college who actually makes the final decision on the presidency. I think we ought to have a national popular vote. Then I think more people would come out if they felt their vote counted rather than just Ohio's vote counting or Florida's vote counting. It should be the national vote counts. I can can only underline how very important a person in such a discussion how Dean is because of his experience. Unfortunately, he has to leave the panel before it ends. I'm, I'm going to ask the public to put questions to Mr. Dean before he has to leave us. Someone up here, please bring the microphone to the man asking for the floor here in the blue jacket. Very short question, give your name. I'm a tourist here in Davos. Mrs. Speak spoke about the security in the world, and this is not something that I can accept from the American side. After the Second World War, the United States has waged war and economic war all over the globe. And I've just heard that uh, human rights are not really um, respected in the United States themselves, and I hope that the new government will change its uh, attitude. Mr. Ha Mr. Dean, can you can you can you corroborate that or approve it? Yes, no, we've understood your question. Thank you. I think you'll certainly see the new administration close Guantanamo, um, but I also would remind you that after World War II, we did not wage economic war all over the. Well, in fact, we put in so much money into Europe that you were able to develop the European Union, which is one of the most extraordinary things that have happened. The Marshall Plan was an extraordinary piece of, was an extraordinary far-sighted piece, I might say, by one of my Democratic heroes, Harry Truman. As, as a result, the Europeans, I think, have accomplished one of the most extraordinary things in the history of mankind, which is the unity of Europe. Probably the most important thing on the globe, we were having this back and forth between Iran and the United States. But quietly, the expansion of the European Union is the, is the most peaceful, achieve, peace uh, achieving uh, thing that has been done by humankind in the last 50 years. And I was very proud that the Americans were able to jumpstart Europe economically to let that happen. So while there have been certainly American missteps, I think there's also been great American contributions. Thank you. Another question over here. My name is Joseph. Mr. Weizenbaum. On the 11th of January of this year, the United States took a historic step backward, about 150 years backward to the times of slavery, a circuit court in Washington, that is a court which is just below the Supreme Court, heard a case of four people who were tortured in Guantanamo 
they sued um, several high-ranking officials, as Mr. Rumsfeld, and this court refused to hear this complaint because these were individuals who were not considered as persons as defined by the Constitution. The Fifth Amendment starts by saying no person shall be deprived, so on and so forth. What's your question, asked the moderator? Well, my question is as follows. Why doesn't anyone know about this here? Why isn't it mentioned? It is a historical decision and ruling. Why none of why do none of the presidential candidates talk about this, mention it? One Republican. Most of the Republicans support torture. But John McCain, having been tortured himself in the Vietnamese prison, does not support torture. And every American, every Democrat believes that this president doesn't understand the Constitution of the United okay. States of America. Moment, Moment, Moment. And has appointed... Entschuldigung, lassen Sie Herrn Dean ausreden, bitte schön. Every Democrat believes this president does not understand the Constitution, has not enforced it. It's one of the reasons Alberto Gonzalez was forced to resign by the Democrats uh, from the Attorney General's office. Uh, the fact of the matter is this president has not upheld human rights uh, in the United States, and Guantanamo is a great embarrassment. It has undermined the moral authority of the United States all over the world. We plan to close Guant Guantanamo and regain our moral authority by doing so. My question was, whether the presidential candidates and McCain actually mentioned this historic ruling of the circuit court of the 11th of January. Yes, we understood your question. Did you want to take the floor and respond on that? Quickly, um, in the last eight years, I've been embarrassed to be an American in relationship to the issues of torture and in the relationship to prison camps. As General Secretary of the National Council of Churches, I stood on the steps of the Supreme Court next to Terry Waite, who had been in prison for five years and looked into the cameras and said, no American appreciated my being in prison for five years without access to lawyers, to due process, and to family. Why is it okay for you to have a prison camp in Cuba at Guantanamo where prisoners are held without access to due process to families and to uh, legal counsel. Uh, my belief is that that uh, court decision was wrong, and I hope that we can change inside America the court system to give due process and due rights. If any other country had taken five or 600 persons and placed them on an island and held them captive without access to process, most Americans would be outraged. I think 9-11 has caused Americans to be fearful, and my hope that one of the results of this coming election is that Americans will recognize that they ought to be fearful that our health care system doesn't work and our education system needs to be improved, uh, that we need to be fearful that we don't use our international um, collaboration well to save the whole planet uh, together on issues like global warming and resource issues. Um, but in the specific case that you mentioned, um, I think the candidates uh, in both political parties should be asked that question. Uh, and I think that we should be on record against torture, but also against the imprisonment of anyone from any country, regardless of how violent they may or may not have been. The one strong core principle in America is that we believe in due process, in the legal process, and in the rights of, of citizens. And that's been violated over the last uh, few years. Thank you. Thank you. A very short bit of instruction. We are still talking about what next. That's the main topic. Of course, a lot has happened in the last seven years that you may have a great urge to comment on what has happened and what Bush has done or not done. But we are talking about what will happen after Bush. But I have promised Mr. Portman that he'd be able to take the floor on this particular subject. On those instructions, I'll try to be future-oriented. Uh, I'm not an expert on the court case the gentleman asked about. I think it was an issue of standing and whether they had standing to sue 
including, as you said, former Secretary Rumsfeld and, and others. Um, and I'm not an expert on Guantanamo. I haven't visited it yet. I wish I had to be able to speak with more authority. Maybe some of you have. I know the Red Cross has, uh, despite what was said earlier. Uh, but but one of the one of the realities uh, is that I think sometimes the U.S. position is is misunderstood. Uh, earlier there was discussion about an arrogant superpower, or, or, and even offense taken to uh, Bob's description of a humble superpower. What we should be, I, I would say, America is a reluctant superpower. If anything, I think many Americans uh, would prefer for us not to be in that role. And I'm not sure what the world looks like without us in that role, because we are in so many places in the world, whether it's taking the lead on fighting AIDS in Africa or now malaria, or whether it's my area, the, the trade area, we are the leaders in liberalization trying to knock down barriers. And in terms of Guantanamo, very tough situation. One of the issues, as you know, is uh, to shut down Guantanamo means you move these people somewhere. And many countries, as you know, perhaps, have been asked to take uh, their citizens back who are at Guantanamo, and they refuse to do so for good reason, I suppose. They don't want them to be extradited because they don't want to deal with them because these are people who have been caught in the war. They're enemy combatants. There are certainly some individual cases where we hear in the media of some sympathetic cases of someone who didn't have the due process. But for the most part, these are very hardened terrorists who want to do harm and to say that we should have them but be let go is not just a danger to the United States, it's a danger to the countries where they're from and indeed to, uh, I would say, Western Europe and, and so many other freedom-loving countries. So this is a tough issue. It's sort of like the reluctant superpower. If we could get a solution where these people won't have to be at Guantanamo, they can go back to their countries and be handled there, I think the American people would be very happy with that. And so would the American government, a Republican or a Democrat administration going forward. And I suspect we'll get to that point as we are right now going through a due process with being able to selectively pull out some people into the U.S. court system and then some people who can be extradited. But there needs to be a commitment on behalf of the countries where they come from also to take them back. Unfortunately, Howard Dean has to leave us. Thank you very much for having participated. I love just a short phrase. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you. Just a short phrase. I said yesterday to the Secretary of Home to the Secretary of Homeland Security in the United States. Yesterday, I told him, if you control the discrimination. If you omit the discrimination, there will be no terrorism. The extremists are the children of discrimination. If you omit the discrimination, there will be no extremist, no terrorist. Das ist ein Satz. That is a phrase that I think deserves being further developed and could be developed. I think some people right at the back of the hall would like to put the question as well, so would the microphones be brought to the back part? Thank you. My name is Dan. I've been journalist. I'm a journalist. I come from Berlin, and I have a question for Mr. Edgar. I very much liked your statement by which you said that one step towards the solution would be to halve nuclear weapons by half, and I would have thought it would be welcomed by a lot of applause. And secondly, you said that the United States will be uh, are you confident about the United States will find a new legal system? Would that mean that the United States would also recognize the uh, international tribunal in The Hague? It would be my hope that they would, and that the United States would uh, take a more international perspective, not only in the, in the Hague issue, but also in the global conversation around issues like global warming. Uh, we need to be partners and players in that conversation and not the sole negative vote for either business reasons or political reasons. Um, my, my vision, uh, I, I'm really a disciple of Dr. Martin Luther King. 
And Dr. King said, we're now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there's such a thing as being too late. He goes on to say, we still have a choice today, nonviolent coexistence or violent co-annihilation. This may well be humankind's last chance to choose between chaos and community. I think what's critical for all of us, in whether it's Switzerland or Iran or any nation on planet Earth, is how we create community moving forward so that our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren can inherit a planet that is free of nuclear violence and free of the kind of uh, terrorism that we have seen. I don't think you attack terrorists by military action. I think uh, we can do some positive work through police action, but I think the better way to address the issue of terrorism is to address the issue of poverty. It was the previous pope who said it best in a very short way. He said, I dream of a world where none will be so poor they have nothing to give and none will be so rich they have nothing to receive. And armut is and poverty is also part of the discrimination you are talking about, Ayatollah. It is. Of course, it is one of the most important samples for that, but it is not the only one. I think we need justice in different issues, social justice, human justice, economical justice. And if we reach to this justice throughout the world, I think it, the management will be so much easier. My friend says, how can we have a globe without superpower, I think it's easy to consider it. It, it. We have, as I said, we are mature enough to cooperate. If there are some uh, rich, they can help the poor. It doesn't mean that they should uh, govern the poor because they have more money. It just they w should help the poor. And the situation, I think, all the software is, and even the hardware is uh, now available for a global justice. Aber könnte nicht Iran hier But couldn't Iran also take on a more productive role? We always talk about the fact that Hezbollah is an organization in, in which works together with Iran to be very careful about the way we term it. So wouldn't it perhaps be a good thing if one could put more focus on on fighting poverty and doing social assistance work rather than fighting and of course it doesn't relate to the next uh, election in United States but I answer this question <laughs> even if it is out of the uh, list and you were insisting on the people that they do not ask uh, issues out of the border but I answered it to this question the issue of Hezbollah is the issue of resistance the issue of the resistance of a poor weak nation against superpowers who are coming and helping the other side. You know, the issue of Gaza happened when Mr. Bush visited the region and visited Israel. After that, the issue of Gaza happened. It is the problem. There is no other choice for Lebanon. There is no other choice option for Lebanon except resistance. They are taking care of their own dignity and their crime is that they want to be a good human being just like the others. It is the problem. And you call them terrorists because they are resisting against the others that they are trying to invade their country. You know, when they, uh, they want to invade uh, Lebanon and they are resisting it, then they are the terrorists, they are the mm, major source of danger and so on. But if you refer to the facts, I think they are just taking care of their own dignity. I come back to the question that was put, uh, Mr. Portman. I think uh, for all of us in Europe, uh, it is a great concern that uh, Bush administration, Cheney, Rumsfeld, uh, really didn't care a lot about international institutions at a certain point in time. Do you see a change with the Republican candidates on the one hand? Me or no, Mr. Portman. Well, first, uh, it's interesting because the first question that was asked that I didn't have a chance to respond to was about what the U.S. position is relative to Iran. And, of course, my immediate reaction to that is it's not the U.S. position. And to say that the U.S. government does not respect 
international institutions is interesting when we continue to go to the United Nations, and in this case the Security Council, even within the last week with Germany uh, as a member, uh, again, uh, asking Iran to do what the global community would like to see them do, which is to open up for inspection the very nuclear uh, power capacity that uh, Ayatollah Avadi has talked about. This is not the United States. This is the international community, and specifically it's the Security Council. So I think it's overstepping it a little bit uh, to say that the administration doesn't respect international institutions. We continue to try to work through international institutions, and we should. I think if you listen to the other candidates on both sides, you, you hear that commitment. I mean, I think you hear it more perhaps from uh, Barack Obama than anyone right now. And the only point I would make is that right now, it's also important that the international institutions gain more credibility by stepping up and helping to solve problems. And there's some skepticism in the United States, shared I think by a lot of people, that sometimes these international institutions um, do not react as quickly as they should, whether it's the Sudan um, issue or whether it is the issue of nuclear nonproliferation. And so I think the new administration, whatever it is, Republican Democrat, will attempt to work through those international institutions, maybe have a more positive attitude at the outset, and, um, but it's also up to those institutions. Eine letzte Frage. One last question right at the back of the room. Can I be sure? Yeah. yeah. I'd like to put a question to Mr. Edgar. We've already referred to the horrible things that have happened in the United States. Couldn't one then say that this is the beginning of the end of the United States as a Christian nation? Well, a very sweeping question for a short final question. And uh, very quickly, the United States is not a Christian nation. The United Nations or the United States persecuted each other in our early beginnings and discovered that we needed to be a pluralistic religious nation that respected uh, Jewish, Muslim, and other faith traditions. And uh, I think some of our radical religious right have called us a Christian nation. But as a Christian, I would say we're a nation that our founding fathers and mothers hoped that we would respect all faiths and those without faith and be a place of freedom of religious thought and expression. Uh, getting behind your question, uh, I, I think that the United States has gone through a, a, a period of time where we've seen uh, issues of greed and selfishness and narrow international view uh, at the highest levels of leadership. And my prayerful hope is as we move forward that uh, we'll respect uh, the seven social sins that Gandhi talked about, where he said we need a nation, uh, we need a world where people have uh, wealth without uh, uh, recognizing its uh, impact on the poor. He talked about politics with principle. He talked about commerce with morality. Uh, I think that throughout all of the faith traditions, um, God is reminding us to pay attention to the poor and to care for the earth and to live as brothers and sisters on the fragile planet earth, whether we live in the United States or Switzerland or Iran or any place. And I would just hope that the moral authority moving forward would be collaboration, cooperation, and community rather than the chaos that we often lead ourselves to. Wouldn't that be a wonderful, conclusive remark? Very nice final word. I give you a brief, more I, final word. I apologize to, to add a dissent here at the, at the end of this uh, very interesting conversation. Uh, first of all, I agree with everything Bob, Bob Gedger said about the fact that the United States is indeed a country that respects pluralism and religion. In fact, we respect the freedom of religion. So we are not a Christian nation. As a Republican and as a Christian, I will tell you we are a country that respects everyone's right to practice whatever faith he or she chooses. And that's very important to our, not just our constitution, but who we are. And I think that's shared by a Western tradition that you see in, uh, many people represented by that in this room. However, I must say, your question disturbs me. I have been respectful and I haven't been asked to comment directly, so I did not about 
lots of allegations today about human rights abuses in the United States. Yes, we had a discussion about Guantanamo. It's a tough issue, as I said earlier, but there has not been one specific instance of what people mean by human rights in the United States. And I hope Bob would agree with me. I believe Howard would if he were here, although I can speak for him since he's gone, which is our human rights situation in the United States is something we are very proud of, and whether it's freedom of religion or whether it's freedom of the press or having individual rights be respected, um, we do not, uh, I don't want to leave the impression by not having responded to some of these general statements that I believe somehow that the human rights situation in the United States uh, is not something that I'm proud of. Thank you. This right of response had to be guaranteed. That is part of the rules of the debate and the fairness. I would just like to summarize very briefly the debate that we've had. And you will agree with me when I say that it's very difficult to do so because so many subjects have been touched upon, so many different statements have been made. It's quite obvious that when you put this question of what next after the next elections, there seems to be hope on all sides that a more rational discourse will become prevalent in the United States and elsewhere as well with the new president, regardless of the party. It is obvious that there are some differences in economic policy that are already emerging. And with regard to international policies, there's one thing I think we have been able to learn from this debate today. It's 50-50 in favor for Hillary Clinton and 50-50 in favor of Mitch Romney. So thank you very much for having come to this debate and taking part in the panel. I'd like to thank the panelists again, and thank you all for having come. Thank you.